Um, if you were here last week, you already heard the intro. I'll try to make it brief, but it's tough to make it brief. And I'm talking about Jane Hallinan because she's really a superstar and we're thrilled to have her. Uh, she's currently a professor at University of West Florida, where she was also a dean of the College in Arts and Sciences for a decade. Um, and her contributions to psychology, both within APA and outside of APA, are countless. Um, she's served as lead on three different uh, task forces that have focused on the undergraduate guidelines for psychology, for the psychology major. She's the co-founding chair of APA's Committee on uh, Baccalaureate and Associate Education. She's co-chair of APA's Summit on National Assessment in Psychology, just to name a few things. Um, she's also the recipient of a lot of awards from APA and other organizations. She's um, won a Distinguished Teaching Award and an award for applications in ed education and training, both from the American Psychological Foundation. So given her deep expertise in undergraduate teaching generally, and certainly in assessment specifically, we are very grateful to have uh, Dr. Jane Hallinan present today at day two of our IPI Course Design Institute. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Jane, thank you. All right, and I'm going to start sharing my screen and get the right desktop and that looks like it should work. And let's see here, getting a, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Well, unlike Sue, I'm in the panhandle of Florida where it's kind of like next door to hell right now. We're expecting temperatures over 100 with about 1,000% humidity. So it's a good day to stay inside and talk about one of my great loves, which is introductory psychology. Um, our session, first session this morning is gonna be on forecasting student performance, which is a fancy way of talking about how do you give fair and effective feedback and how to do that efficiently and effectively. Um, where we've been the, in session uh, in the first day, a week ago, we learned about APA IPI outcomes and how that is designed to promote student transformation in introductory psychology, specifically in the area of content, research skills, and integrative themes. And because I know that there are some new people in the audience, bear with me while we just review quickly what those are. Um, in psychology content, you can see that the overall outcome, the uber outcome, as I like to say, is identify basic concepts and research findings. And essentially, lower level kinds of Bloom's activity, Bloom taxonomy activity, and getting people to define and apply what they're learning. Now, uh, the second set in scientific thinking reinforces the fact that the fundamental backbone of introductory psychology needs to be research skills so that students understand how psychologists solve problems. And so you can see under scientific thinking, we're describing advantages and limitations of different research strategies, evaluating, designing, or conducting psychological research, drawing objective conclusions from empirical evidence, one of the things that's hardest for intro students to master, and then also looking at how psychology fights against misconceptions or what I like to describe to my students as goofy beliefs. The third category that the IPI group came up with was uh, key themes that regardless of how we teach the class, we are going to be revisiting persistent themes that show up in various parts of the class and to be able to recognize the importance of that because when a course is over, we suspect this is what students will remember far longer than how the neuron works as an example. So uh, looking at whether you're organizing a course according to a specific theme or whether you're just setting context to alert students to the fact that they're gonna be seeing this theme pop up from time to time was something that IPI wanted to recognize. In our second session then, we also looked at some specific strategies to illustrate proposed outcomes. And I drew heavily from APA's project assessment, highlighting the work of both college and high school intro teachers to illustrate how you could achieve the specific outcomes that we talked about. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to talk in assessment language. In fact, I think about this as almost an assessment boot camp. We're going to distinguish summative from formative assessment. We're going to explain why criterion-based rubrics have value. 
We're also going to borrow from Carol Dweck in looking at uh, growth mindset and how to give feedback that students can actually hear. We'll also promote self-assessment because uh, our goal as teachers ultimately is to help the student be self-governing and self-directed. And one way to do that is to encourage self-assessment even in the intro class. And then we're going to, in a group breakout, oh boy, group work. I know so for some people, this is a challenge, but one of the reasons that we include group work in this uh, strategy is this is how the psychology community builds. Uh, whether you're a member of the Society of Teachers of Psychology, which I heartily recommend, or if you're simply making connections today with people that you might have some enduring contacts with later, this is a good way to start stretching your resource community to help you solve problems. So we'll be looking at applying standards to uh, the design of a rubric for a specific assessment. All right, so let's start with why is uh, feedback and grading so important? I, I start with a, a cartoon from one of my favorites, Randy Glassberg, and he's just a genius in having funny insights into us. Uh, here's his uh, uh, protagonist. Why is an A or a B better than a C or a D? Aren't all letters equal in the eyes of God? Well, I do have colleagues, I'm going to highlight Eric Landrum here, who says, I can, you know, I can't, for life of me, I can't tell the difference between a C plus and a C. Um, the, the idea of rubric-based grading is it does tend to move us a little bit away from more standardized traditional grading through multiple choice um, testing and objective testing. It moves us toward project-based management. And so we'll be talking about rubrics as a way of managing that process. So the first question you have to deal with is what kind of strategy are you trying to formulate? Is it something that is low stakes where you're simply trying to develop the skills and it may not have points attached to it? Um, it, it examples, we might do a pretest that doesn't count very much toward a grade or a practice exam. Uh, progress reports where uh, you're, you're simply checking in to see how students are doing. Self-assessment practices can be formative. And getting feedback from peers along the way, all of those can help us develop toward an endpoint, in which case now we're talking about high stakes testing where point totals will uh, have a meaningful contribution to a grade and will have some sort of uh, conclusion about how well the student has performed. So in that case, we see that as post-test, major project completion, what kind of score, what kind of performance feedback are you getting on that, uh, content assessments, final exams. And if you're looking in the larger sense for majors, looking at portfolio presentations where you're trying to gather information from across courses, that information gathering can actually start in intro. But here's a, a simple way to remember. Formative uh, is like when the chef tastes the noodles to see if they're ready, throw the spaghetti against the wall, does it stick? Um, summative is whether or not you can make the, the people that you're serving smile with what you've done. Now, another distinction that's drawn in the assessment community is referred to as a grading orientation. Are you holistic in your grading or are you analytic? What I love about the use of holistic grading is it's a pretty fancy way to describe what most of us recognize is, what does your gut say this, this uh, performance is worth? If you stand back from it and go, is it, is it kind of an A? Is it kind of a C? You're not really held to specific standards. You simply make a global judgment on how well uh, the student met what the expectations were. It works best when you're asking for a simple performance or if you have students that are really struggling with how complicated uh, expectations might be. On the other hand, assessment pushes us more toward analytic approaches where we're looking at the component parts. We try to specify performance criteria with each criterion contributing some portion to a grade. With more specific descriptions, uh, the better we are at saying, here's the component I'm looking at, the more likely you're going to get some good test metrics from the standpoint of test reliability. So if we look at the benefits of uh, taking a holistic approach, it's relatively simple and not time consuming, but it's kind of hard to defend and may cause you difficulties when you're dealing with students that fall in the cracks. And there are always students that fall in the cracks. That's just a cosmic law of teaching. 
analytic, um, it's relatively easy to make your instruction really geared toward what it is you're, you're expecting students to do. And it gives you solid ground on which to give students feedback about the strengths and weaknesses that they achieved or didn't achieve in the, the performance that they're managing. Um, it is uh, very adaptable to summative um, assessment judgment, but it's also a little bit time consuming. And I would add to this list, um, if you are serious about continuous improvement, um, analytic, analytic approaches don't ever tend to settle down. We tend to keep revising them as we learn more from the students about what worked in our instruction, what worked in our assessment direction, or what worked to help us motivate students to do their best. We also, in the assessment community, see a distinction drawn between are we talking about norm-referenced approaches or criterion-referenced approaches. In norm-referenced approaches, we assume that statistics hold sway in that whenever we're going to administer a point-generating process, you're going to get a normal distribution. Now, I've always had a little difficulty with that assumption because it seems to me if you are teaching well, there's no reason that you have to have your A's balanced with your F's. And so most of the work that I do in uh, college courses is criterion based, which means that I tend to have um, grade distributions that are probably a little bit higher, but I can justify that based on the performance descriptions that I can offer. So it's a, a real advantage if you work with criterion based. The traditional way that we talk about criterion-based performance is to generate usually three categories. One that says, wow, you did a great job, you exceeded expectations, and notice that there are all kinds of alternative ways you can communicate the wowie zowie factor. It's exemplary, outstanding, mastery, or excellence. The middle category where we might expect the bulk of students to fall, they're, they meet expectations, but uh, translating that into you're proficient, you're competent, you're satisfactory, you're good, it's acceptable. You could have done better, but you could have done worse. And then the third category is do, does not meet expectations. Insufficient, novice status, developing, emerging, needs work, and now my favorite phrase is not yet. And we'll get to why that is shortly. All right, so here's an example of a simple formative rubric that I use in psychology, an in intro. Uh, and that is uh, linked to outcome 1.3, apply psych principles to personal growth and other aspects of everyday life. Um, when I'm teaching intro, I have the distinct pleasure of working with honor students. Oh my, that is really fun, given that uh, those students tend to do their work and do it well. Um, but I hold them accountable for their reading by asking them to write some example, some application, every week so that I know that they're doing the work and I know they're getting the exercise and learning how to move on up the Bloom's taxonomy scale to higher levels of cognitive uh, performance. So the assignment every week, provide a paragraph, no more than 200 words in which you define and apply a concept from your chapter. What I might be looking for in a simple formative rubric is needs to link with the assigned chapter I've learned over time that you actually have to include that as a criterion because for some reason, students may stray off into the chapters that they like the best, that they write clearly with solid conventions, even though it's a simple writing task, I'm still looking for them to be um, improving in their writing and I wanna see good grammar and good uh, punctuation, that they define the content accurately. And by that, I mean, they don't, uh, plagiarized definitions, but they translate it into their own words. That's a skill that if we can teach them in intro, will serve them much later on when they're having to do uh, uh, more complex challenges, whether they're a psych major or not. Learning how to paraphrase is important. That the application reflects a higher Bloom's level, that I'm looking for it at least to represent application or evaluation, and that it's submitted on time or uh, in keeping with IPI, it could be closely related to an integrating theme. I could say, which theme does this come closest to? Um, so that's just one simple example. One point, did you do it or not? One point for each and amass a number of those over the course of a semester. I might count their 10 best efforts so that not everything has to be make or break. 
but uh, students tell me that that process forces them to read, damn it. Um, I, and I love when students say, thank you for forcing me to read. Like, when you think in college, they would just read, but no, that's not the, not the case. All right, so I wanted to share with you a couple other um, evaluation uh, rubrics that grew out of some early work I did at UWF when we were challenged to come up with our, a redesign of our assessment program in you know, just a few weeks to satisfy our uh, state legislators. Don't get me started, that's another long story. But what we attempted to do was set up um, in critical thinking, what are the main functions that happen in critical thinking? So if we're looking at analysis or evaluation, we, ha we have a generic framework that we can use to set up as a rubric. Um, if students are working at an, an, at an analysis or an evaluation level, look at all the things that we're asking them to do potentially, that they're applying discipline-based concepts, that they ask relevant questions, that they develop um, evidence-based arguments, that they apply discipline-based criteria to inform their judgments, or they synthesize information from diverse places, they accurately assess quality of, of how they did. All of those elements can fit in rather nicely into a, an analysis and evaluation project. For problem solving, which is lends itself really well to um, outcomes in psychology, and just as a side note, um, one of the challenges that we talked about last week is that we have so many overlords telling us what we need to do in our courses. And in intro, just as one example, although I have this nice set of guidelines from APA IPI now, the fact is on my campus as a gen ed class, I actually have to, I'm given two types of outcomes that I have to meet according to the, the university plan. That is, I have to demonstrate that my students are reasoning ethically within the discipline, and I have to demonstrate that they can solve problems using disciplinary approaches. So it lends itself to this kind of, uh, the second one lends itself to this kind of approach, that you're gonna define a problem appropriately, that you're going to uh, come up with a discipline-based strategy that may have some concepts built in, that you provide a rationale for why you pick that one in particular, that you apply the strategy successfully, and then you evaluate whether or not it worked. Pretty straightforward. We also took on information literacy. And here again, you see exceeds, meets, and fails. That's a practice now that I don't do. Uh, identifies acceptable types of source material, conducts an appropriate search strategy, uses criteria to determine whether or not a source can be used, and in intro, this is where we begin to help students understand, is this a scholarly peer-reviewed good scientific conclusion or is it not? Is it Wikipedia? Is it psychology today? Is it uh, Vogue? Is it something that is really not respectable and therefore shouldn't necessarily be trusted? Uh, did they generate sufficient depth? Did they use the number of resources that you were asking them to do? And uh, overall, how well did the material support? So notice, just even in those three examples, you've got some uh, uh, rubrics that can be imported to help define uh, a project uh, that might align with those outcomes. So here's why failure may not be the way to go in feedback. And I'm uh, posting the picture of Carol Dweck here because in a very powerful TED talk that she gave, a very short, I recommend it, very short TED talk on the power of not yet, that if you assume that all learners are capable of developing a growth mindset, then if they are not achieving what they need to achieve according to the standards that you've set within the time frame that you've set, it's probably easier for them to hear I'm not there yet, or I'm developing. So not successful is even better than you failed. Uh, but in general, that's become so popular with my students that they use, you're not there yet when they're giving feedback to others. I also thought it might be helpful to talk about specifying behavior criteria in relation to each of the levels that we're, that we're addressing in our projects. And while this isn't exactly the rubric I wanted, I used to use one from several years ago that uh, was a bit more comprehensive. It does get across the idea that if you were trying to develop 
superhero powers um, and you had three criteria, speed, leaping, and strength, you could translate what does it mean to look exemplary, what does it mean to look adequate, and what does it mean to look beginning. Sometimes that's also expert to um, uh, developing to not yet. Another emerging practice that I find uh, helpful in some circumstances is something called the single point rubric. In this case, you still have three levels of performance, but you assume in that middle column that students are going to at least achieve competence. And so when you're giving students feedback, you can circle if they've achieved the um, uh, middle level of competence, but if they haven't achieved in the concerns area, you can identify what the problem is. You don't have to write um, gone with the wind in that box, but the point is if they haven't quite achieved the standard, you can say why, and more so on the advanced side, if they've done a really good job, you can use this rubric as a way of reinforcing for students what great performance uh, transpired in that project. So I'm gonna share a few rubric tips and then I'm gonna turn you loose into a breakout room in which we're gonna ask you to take on uh, the design of a rubric based on an assignment either that you come up with or you borrow from a suggestion from me. But here are some tips that may be useful in your consideration. I always find that uh, it's best to share the rubric that I'm going to use with the students. Now, there are some uh, opponents of this process that say something that takes away their learning, but the fact is it makes me recall when I was in graduate school and I had a social psychology professor who wanted us to do a theoretical analysis of articles. And I didn't know what that, I didn't, I couldn't figure out what he meant. What do you mean a theoretical analysis of articles? And had I had a model or had I had a rubric, uh, it would have been a lot easier to navigate whatever was in his head that he wasn't able to share with us. So the point of rubric design is what's in your head you share with students and it doesn't hurt to provide models as well. You wanna use in the rubric language that the, that the learner understands. The rubric is designed to assist the, the student to acquire those skills and learn the, that, that set of knowledge. Uh, so it needs to be student friendly. It's also uh, useful to observe, I, I, I love this reference because this is one of those facts that's changed over time. Observe Miller's magic number, seven plus or minus two, which really isn't seven plus or minus two, it's more like five plus or minus two, really, um, that you don't wanna overwhelm students with a, a, a huge number of criteria because that can simply be uh, daunting for them to face. Try to limit your criteria to the most important, the most salient features. And if you can restrict the levels of performance, uh, so much the better. Um, articulating the behavioral descriptors in each of those is especially useful. Uh, even when you do that, if you use three categories, you're gonna find that sometimes students will fall in the cracks and it's okay to say, you know, you're on the, you're on the border. Uh, in assessment language, it's also important that you focus on observable verbs. And I'm I, something I really hammer on my colleagues about. You, you're not looking at an outcome for appreciate or understand because how do you know that someone understands or appreciates unless you see some overt reflection of that? So it's the overt reflection of that that is much more accessible than will appreciate Freudian theory. Well, how do you know? Um, move it to a different, more action-oriented verb. And then I've hinted at this before that you need to, once you adapt assessment as a lifestyle or a toolkit, you need to expect that everything evolves, that what works in one semester probably is gonna need tweaking based on the experience that you have with students, their feedback about what worked and what didn't. Um, you wanna focus on feedback that students can use to improve. And this addresses what I think is a really bad habit that a lot of uh, individuals have experienced in college. If you're learning to give feedback to students, the tendency is to just criticize, 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 identify all the negatives. 
And uh, students will often say, especially if you are doing that feedback in red, that it looks like you bled all over their papers. Um, the point is you really should, even in the worst possible uh, performances, you should be able to find something that a student achieved to be able to soften the blow of whatever constructive feedback is going to follow. So you, you wanna make sure that you identify some things that have been achieved and then pave the way for them to hear, here's what needs to be improved. I also think it's helpful if you give students the rubric, ask if they have questions, but also say, do you have any feedback? Is there anything that's unclear? Because you still have time to make those corrections before you then apply that rubric. Now, they may be more likely to give you feedback after they get a rubric and your feedback. They'll know more clearly what to give you. But even from the outset, it's not a bad idea to get that information. I've always thought that uh, if I explain to students that I'm experimenting continuously, that they appreciate the fact that I am trying to improve the experience for them and for future students. And so they tend to be very cooperative. And if you have the time, if you're in um, a more luxurious time situation, you can also get students to design the rubric, uh, especially if they've had some experience with rubrics that you've done before. Now, uh, just a, a final note before we do the, the group breakout. Um, I'm also a big fan of self-assessment. One of the things I really love to do, this makes my students uh, stunned and shocked and awed, is if they have a major project due, I ask them, I'm gonna ask them now, you, you did the project, you see the rubric. Tell me, tell me what you think you did on the rubric. Give me a point estimate. Tell me what was a strength. Tell me what was a weakness. And depending again on the situation in the class, I may say, all right, now I'm going to ask you to take your assignment back and give you three more days to fix what you think is wrong. And the relief that students have is enormous. And they really do tend to see me as a partner in the enterprise instead of the witch handing out the grades. Um, Practice in applying rubrics to one's own performance. If we ask students to apply what they're learning through the rubric, the idea here is that they incorporate, they internalize the rubric, they internalize being a judge of their own performance, and that can serve them so well beyond intro. Um, so important to ask students about filling out the rubric before you grade it. Uh, and that also gives you some cues before you attempt to grade it to understand where the student's coming from, because that might make a difference in how you phrase your feedback. But one of the risks of um, self-assessment is the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is we don't know what we don't know. And intro students are sometimes stunning in their overconfidence when uh, the, it shows up, especially in that first exam, you give them the first exam, you tell them it's going to be hard, they smile and go, yeah, I've studied before, and then they get back the exam and they haven't done well at all because they really didn't study. They did their drive-by reading. They thought just, you know, a simple run-through would work. They were overconfident. And so what Dunning and Kruger said is that um, Initially, we are going to be overconfident. We're going to um, overestimate what we've achieved. And you can see that in self-assessments as well. But with additional practice, students get better so they can avoid being on the peak of Mount Stupid, as uh, Dunning and Kruger said. All right, so here's what we're going to do for 15 minutes in the breakout. Um, Sue's going to send you to a breakout room. And what I'd like you to do is briefly share a homegrown assessment that might be in need of a rubric. Once you share, here's what I do, pick one of those and collectively develop a rubric that you think would communicate well to students what the performance expectation should be. I'm asking you to do that with three levels of achievement. So you'll break out, let's say four or five criteria at three levels of achievement, not yet, the gentle way to say you messed up, competent and distinguished. And then, uh, in that matrix that gets formed, describe what those performances would look like behaviorally. And so if it turns out that in the mix of people, you either are shy about sharing an assessment that you think would work for rubric design, 
um, I'm going to share with you, you try this one out that links with uh, skill development in scientific thinking. Have students design a research study on the popularity of banning phone use during class. So what we're looking at is having them design a survey. Um, they can survey teachers, they can survey students, but what would really good performance look like? What would exemplary performance look like? And what would uh, not yet look like? All right. So Sue, if you can go ahead and uh, do that room assignment. I will do that. Um, actually, if you, if you want to make sure you have these instructions, it should be in the chat. So you could um, copy them and paste them. So you have them in the chat. We'll send them out again as a broadcast as well. I'm going to create breakout rooms and you should look for that little box that says that you should um, join your room. I can't tell, has the room assignment worked? Uh, people are going <laughs> as we speak. Okay. Everyone has to click on their own um, after they're invited to join, to join. So it's a little bit of a process and I'm just moving so, some so people please around. Do, too. Please do click on join. <laughs> we want, want you to have the experience of meeting some new colleagues. I'm just moving there are some people who are in a room kind of on their own. Um, but for those of you who co-host, I did not assign you to a room, um, but you can join a room if you want, maybe a room that doesn't have a co-host there. Sorry, I'm just scanning the room here to make sure everyone's set. <laughs> And I was putting people in rooms. I totally didn't catch the time. So it was maybe like 11.36 or so. And you wanted them there for 10-ish minutes. Is that right? I think I said 15. 15, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so 10, 10 till is when we could, should bring them back. Okay. <laughs> with me. <Sure. laughs> well, I hope your adventure in the breakout room was successful, whether you were able to come up with a rubric uh, that was satisfying or whether you just were able to develop some new relationships uh, with some new colleagues. Either goal is fine. Um, but um, let's see, wondering what observations can you share about your collaborative rubric experience? And here what we're going to ask you to do is just simply unmute. And we know that it is uh, sometimes challenging in a virtual environment to steal your nerves and say, all right, here's what we came up with, or here's a question that we had, but we're looking to try to help uh, all boats rise based on the experiences that you had in the room. Alternatively, you can also enter in chat an observation. So is there anyone brave out there to say, here's, here's what we came up with, or here's what we concluded from the experience? Um, I'm not sure that our example was that was that like sexy, but one of the things that we definitely recognized as we were going through it was that we had an easier time figuring out what is on the lower side, the left side of it, like 
what needs improvement and not as much on the right side. You know, what does exemplary look like? And one, one of my, my team. If you get, if you get skilled at building, designing and incorporating rubrics, one of the values of it is it will shorten the amount of time that you spend grading. Because if the expectations are written out clearly, you can check off. You might also have to encourage students to recognize that a check mark on a pre-written designated criterion is a form of getting feedback. Sometimes I think feedback is only constituted when you put narrative to it. But that's one of the clear values of doing a single uh, design, single criterion rubric. Um, I think, again, to emphasize, it's important to share with students that you are constantly trying to improve what you're communicating to students. And so any feedback they can provide for you before or after the fact is very useful. And then the lesson for me from social psychology in graduate school is if I can provide a model of what a good performance looks like, then I can, I can have a better shot at achieving what it is that will be satisfying. And so I don't have any problems at all identifying, getting good models from students, asking for their opinion, uh, their permission to post and then saying, okay, in this kind of assignment, this is what a good model looks like. So now you're on your own to adapt that to your voice. Okay, with that, then um, what we're gonna do now is take a, a 30 break. And when you come back, we're gonna talk about forging your tentative transformation plan. And the reason that it's written in caps is there's a lot more to the IPI Institute. And so basically we're gonna be setting forth a preliminary structure of what you think you want to do that ultimately will be filled in over the next uh, uh, several sessions uh, so that you'll come up with your hard and fast plan. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you in about a half hour. Thanks everyone. Again, you can just um, shut off your camera and audio or you can sign out and sign back in using the same link and we'll see you in a half hour. <laughs>